All right, thank you everyone for joining uh, today's uh, webinar entitled Insights for Billing Using Category 3 CPT Codes for Hospital-Based 3D Printing. Uh, my name is Andy Christensen. I'm happy to be here today uh, moderating this exciting session. Um, I want to thank uh, in advance our, um, our co-panelists, uh, Dr. Jonathan Morris from the Mayo Clinic, uh, Dr. Frank Rubicki from the University of Cincinnati, and Dr. Justin Ryan from Rady Children's Hospital. Uh, this is a great a great group, I think, to talk through, uh, you know, a, a really pressing topic for the SIG and for 3D printing and medicine in general. Um, we're going to start a little bit uh, just to, to recap uh, for those not familiar, uh, the, the RSNA 3D printing special interest group is a special interest group of RSNA, uh, a membership uh, organization uh, of over 52,000 members focused on on education and radiology. Um, the SIG itself uh, has a purpose to uh, promote uh, education, collaboration, and research. If you're not a member, uh, please join us and become a member. Today we have over 500 members, and uh, the current leadership of the SIG include Pete Leocoris, uh, the chair, uh, Abdan Sheikh, the vice chair, and myself as secretary, and Nicole Wake as treasurer. Our group has uh, you know, been involved in some great, uh, uh, some opportunity, taken opportunities and been involved in some great uh, projects relating to uh, creating uh, the further infrastructure for 3D printing in a hospital environment. Uh, some of those things are here uh, listed, including um, collaboration on um, uh, appropriateness, uh, collaboration on, with the FDA, other work uh, that we'll talk about some more specifically today, I know relating to the 3D printing registry in collaboration with the ACR and uh, their active groups in quality assurance, regulatory education and others. So if you're interested in getting involved, please, uh, please get involved. So to start uh, today, I wanna, uh, we're gonna have a um, panel discussion is the majority of the, of the session, but I'm gonna start by giving just a brief recap of the category three CPT codes and kind of the uh, the vision for the timeline that we're on. Uh, and then Dr. Frank Rubicki is gonna give a little bit of a deeper um, and broader overview of reimbursement, uh, just to kind of lay the groundwork before we get into uh, into some moderated Q&A. So our journey, uh, the, the SIG has, has been part of this journey, uh, collaborating very closely with ACR uh, relating to trying to move toward eventually category one CPT codes. So a little bit of the history here, um, you know, all in all this project, um, it, it, uh, it will be, you know, somewhat close to a 10 year project by the time it's done. So it's a major project. It's obviously key for where we're trying to go in making 3D printing in a hospital environment more mainstream. Um, so the category three codes for those that don't know became effective in July, a year ago, 2019. Um, and so we're currently in kind of a, uh, in what I'm calling the evidence and registry phase where we're uh, using those codes and gathering further information to eventually support submission of one or more category one CPT codes. Um, so as we talk a little bit about, you know, the timing, um, you know, that, that uh, evidence and registry phase needs to take some time. Uh, we'll hear a little bit more about the registry and where we're at, but the registry it, has just gone live for case submissions. So most within the SIG will know that, and we've had some great webinars on, um, on case submission and how the registry works. That just went live this year. Uh, we're now collecting data and, uh, and it hopes to move forward. The codes themselves, uh, four codes were established, two for anatomic models, two for anatomic guides. Um, the way they're set up, the first for anatomic models, the first code is related to the first uh, individually prepared and processed component, the, kind of the major component. The second code is an individually, uh, an additional individually prepared uh, component of an anatomic structure. And for guides, the first code is for the first guide and the, and the additional uh, code, the additional guides would be listed in the second code. So just a little bit more information there. Uh, there is some more detail and some of this may be a repeat for some of you, but um, 0559T really relates to the most significant portion of anatomy for the anatomic model. Uh, modifiers may be appropriate. You can talk with your institution. Um, this code can only be used once per case. It's kind of the main the main code. And then 0560T becomes the add-on. So if you had a a uh, a case with you know a model with six structures, you would have a single 0559T and then five 
uh, 0560Ts. Uh, again, this is to be used as many times as needed. Um, it Because these codes are uh, the category three codes, they're not valued today. So they the, the fact that you may use one or 10 additional uh, 0560T doesn't necessarily relate to how much reimbursement may occur, but it's good for collecting information. And the same for guides, so 0561T related to the guide. Uh, the first guide and uh, additional guides would be uh, noted with 0562T. Uh, so to talk a little bit about the registry, uh, a key part of uh, the SIG strategy for this whole area is to gather data. And specifically, this is in a clinical environment. And the registry really is focused on, on showing uh, three main Three main things. One is widespread usage. So to proceed to a category one, you have to uh, to show widespread usage across the country. Uh, number two is to kind of demonstrate typical case types uh, for for each uh, type of uh, for each diagnosis for each type of clinical case. Uh, and this may be about you know the types of models, the numbers of models, the materials of models, other things that kind of go into you know the quality and the uh, and the cost really that needs to be uh, you know per case. And then further. Uh, the effort, you know, documenting the effort to produce the models, uh, as well as what's very important, I think, for the next stage is the clinical utility that we continue to kind of gather data on clinical utility of these models to support future reimbursement. So, if you're interested, I would definitely, uh, I would definitely encourage you to join the effort, whether you're part of a large institution or a small institution, uh, join the effort for the 3D printing registry. Uh, you're your, uh, your work can definitely help this whole area progress. Uh, the link there at the bottom, and uh, thanks again to, uh, to ACR for, uh, for all the help. So I'm now gonna turn, uh, turn this over to Dr. Frank Rabicki to talk uh, a little bit about uh, the broader scope for uh, reimbursement to kind of give us a ground, some groundwork for, uh, for the further discussion today. So Dr. Rabicki. Thanks for having me as part of the talk that we're giving today. I'm just going to show some more basic slides, and some of the things will be repeated from um, things that you've seen in past webinars. But I think it is important to get everyone up to speed in terms of the reimbursement infrastructure because it's foreign to so many people that are in the field and even foreign to people that are uh, in the space. Um, I, I do have um, one disclosure, um, a financial disclosure. Um, I'm the medical director uh, at an artificial intelligence company, but we have no um, vertical in 3D printing whatsoever. So everything um, that I say is uh, completely um, void of any commercial uh, interest whatsoever. <laughs> So I first showed this slide in 2018 at the annual meeting of RSNA. And no matter how you kind of go around this circle, these are the, the significant things that relate who we are, which is a you know, group of uh, people who are trying to deliver anatomic and anatomic guides into the medical sector from the basis of the hospital. And we're all kind of moving towards uh, that value added. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about uh, reimbursement today, but all of these six points are, are really interconnected. I think as Andy explained a little bit already, so I want you to keep all of those things in mind because they all have an important role uh, in the reimbursement uh, pathway. Uh, this is not at all a political uh, political ad. But uh, this is a, this is the um, uh, the picture from the from which the dollar bill is created. It's at the the MFA in Boston. Every time I look at it, I actually think of something different and uh, about its kind of unfinished nature. And uh, we're um, I guess we're trying to fill in a lot of this uh, white space uh, over this several year journey that uh, we're in to get um, reimbursement. Hopefully. This session and some of these slides will help to fill in parts that have been colored in um, uh, so far and, and help uh, give a roadmap. So I'll spend a few minutes talking about what the CPT code is. It is our standard code set 
and it's a five digit code. And whenever there is a medical service and that service is going to be reimbursed by, um, by CMS, it goes through and, and the fact of other payers too, it goes through the AMA CPT terminology and it exists as a category one code and a category one code is one that's gone through um, multiple iterations of discussions and actually has a an RVU that's assigned to billing. We'll talk about getting from where we are now, which is the category three code to getting toward there in a moment. But in general, the CPT codes provide that language. It's in a book. You can look at the book. It's published every year. And it really is the effective means for communication amongst different procedures and things that will happen um, that do get reimbursed. And I have here just a picture of the physical 2020. I'm going to leave out category two codes because they don't really apply uh, to this discussion, but there are <clears throat> several factors of a category one code that we need to consider. Um, the first one is that category one goes to the RUC, which is sometimes called the RUC, if you will, for valuation. And so when you have a category one code, it's valued against all of the other relative procedures and really all of the procedures that are done. And that's done in a separate AMA meeting where there are representatives of all different medical specialties. That valuation depends on how advisors uh, support the code and how much peer reviewed literature exists and the quality of that literature. And that hopefully will help people understand why, you know, this the special interest group and things like the 3D printing and medicine journal and the registry are all trying to build uh, towards that uh, literature. Um, so I think that's um, um, a really important thing for you to remember. When, um, when we set out to get the category three codes, it was a decision that was made because the state of 3D printing, while very mature in some niche applications, really had some limited dissemination. It had literature that suggests future growth in utility. And when we got the category three code, it's very important to know that that code was a successful application, but it hasn't been valued yet at the RUC. And the decision to make it a category three code was done in conjunction with getting that information so that we could value the state of the art highly enough that people would be satisfied for the reimbursement that they got. The trade-off was that in the meantime, the period that Andy's called this um, data gathering um, area, I can't remember the exact words he used, Andy, but um, they were good ones. We, we would not get the reimbursement and um, that, that people sought, but by entering data in the registry, which was part of the, uh, if you will, agreement to generate the category three codes, we would move forward and we would be able to gather that data. So a little bit about the editorial panel. The panel is responsible for maintaining the code set. It's authorized by the board of the AMA. Um, there is a radiologist on the panel and no matter what specialty society you're from or you relate to, there is someone on that panel that's designed to represent you whether you're a cranium axial surgeon, whether you're a radiologist. Because we are the SIG and we are radiology group based group for uh, 3D printing, I thought I would just list a couple uh, codes. These are generic codes that people who do building in radiology will know every day. This is the code for a chest X-ray, code for an MRI. 
And one of the key things that I want people to understand is that just because you have a code doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get a payment and it doesn't mandate the payment that you get. A code after it goes to the RUC is translated to an RVU, right? a relative value unit. And it's the RBRVS within the specialty that, that creates that scale of units and that's done by the subspecialty called the RUC, which I described earlier, which is the Relative Value Scale Update Committee. That's what the RUC stands for. And so every time that there is a new procedure um, or any procedure, that procedure is placed in a relative value unit um, and it's on that scale from a very, very low uh, RVU procedure to a very, very high RVU procedure. And things we do in radiology, you know, interventional radiology falls more in the higher scale. Some of the uh, simpler, um, you know, less time consuming, I don't want to say simple, <laughs> less time consuming tasks, you know, follow in the, the, uh, in the lower scale. But everything is in a, a scale in some place. And you could see um, some more, more complex or more time consuming studies, you know, may have closer to two RVUs, whereas some uh, less complex studies have fractional RVUs. The total RVU is made up of the, the PC, the physician work, as well as the, um, uh, the practice expense, uh, the technical code that goes in there. So the total RVU that you have regard is, includes the physician work plus um, the practical expense. And we're going to talk a bit about that um, so that everyone kind of understands what constitutes uh, quote unquote physician work um, versus non-physician work. This is just a, um, uh, a screenshot from my ACR um, homepage. Um, and this is uh, just to give people a lay of the land, because again, people probably don't understand where the American College of Radiology uh, fits in. The Economics Commission of the ACR, you know, has um, a, a whole a group of people um, that are dedicated to volunteering and serving uh, the community and those people, you know, manage advocacy and um, economics, uh, radiology economics is uh, part of it, and all of the different um, coding resources and uh, decisions and um, transitions and efforts of the college can be found at the ACR website. Um, so uh, the ACR is a, um, a, a critical part of that. And I guess I should also disclose I'm a, a member now of the Economics um, Commission and I'm there largely to um, uh, to help along this um, long journey that we're uh, that we're all undertaking. So um, Andy mentioned the registry and, and this is an older slide, but I think that it's still very, very valid that we need when we submit a category one code, we need data and the main data sets need to show one, that 3D printing is widely used and that it has value. And widely used does not necessarily mean just ad hoc raise your hand because um, when you're filling out the forms and you're doing the work and you're at that big U-shaped table, um, you don't show raises of hands, you have to show data. Um, and um, that's why it's so important to include lots of centers in, in the registry and to have them be um, certainly some from the US, but um, from all over the world. And we have to publish um, that material and ideally publish it in high impact uh, journals. Um, although um, all publications um, that are part of PubMed and the peer review system are uh, applicable including our own journal um, that has six papers just in the month of August. And so um, you know, those are um, very important things um, uh, to include. And that's why it's so important that you include your information in the registry. Um, so I'll close in a minute, but you just read the slides and we have to show value. Um, we need to get fair reimbursement. We need to you know, follow along the pathway uh, that we've started uh, already, and I'd like to show, you know, these kinds of, um, you know, big picture um, discussions of things that I think that we need to, to do 
you know, we need to work together in a federated style. And I think that the registry allows us to do that, especially if you fill out all the questions. Um, we really need to think about how we're, um, how we're moving towards uh, the reimbursement and attending this webinar, I think is really helpful. Um, and we have to remember that in the end, um, the college um, is lobbying uh, in our behalf and on behalf of um, uh, the radiology sector in doing um, 3D printing for anatomic models and anatomic guides. And uh, we are on it and we are thinking strategically uh, moving ahead. I think that's my last slide. I think that's a good place to kind of wrap up you know, my small portion and uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Andy, to, to think a little bit, um, think about how to structure it. Um, here's my contact information and I'll post all of the slides um, in one way or another. And of course, I, I do believe this is a recorded session so anyone can look at it, but if you want the slide deck, anyone can have it at any time, any, any of my slide decks. Thank you. Thanks, Frankie. That was a great, great overview. I think that is uh, helpful to kind of frame the bigger picture for all of us. Um, we'll move now to um, we'll move now to a Q and A session. Um, everyone joining today, uh, note that there is a Q and A um, box, I believe, on the right side, bottom of your screen. So if you have a question for the panel, please. Uh, please type it there. We will try to get to some of those as well as some questions that we've uh, created ourselves. Uh, let's see, Frankie, if we get you on, if video works and we'll kind of move into just, um, I think chatting by video, if that works for everybody. So let's uh, welcome uh, Justin and Jay to the, uh, to the discussion. Um, it's great to have you. It's great to have you both with us today. Um, so let's move, let's move into, you know, I think, um, for me, some of that higher level, uh, discussion really helps to kind of frame, you know, where we are in relation to where we think we're going. And I think a bit of it is obviously about the value, um, you know, and I want to get into talking about some of that, but before we can kind of get to really, you know, maybe some of the more than nitty gritty of how you, you know, value this work within your institution and the value of the registry. We've kind of got to like get going, you know, in terms of get this going with your individual institutions. So I wonder, Justin, if we might start off with you um, talking about, you know, the, we've heard about the reimbursement system, um, but starting from scratch, where does an institution start and what, you know, what types of folks within institutions can be um, can be allies for kind of learning the, uh, the lay of the land and, and getting things going? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks to Darius Nay for, for hosting this. Um, for those of you not familiar with Rady Children's, we're, we're a freestanding institution. We're, we're kind of mid-sized nonprofit, so we certainly have the challenges of a, a shoestring budget. The, the labs like us, you know, we largely go by research opportunities, by philanthropic opportunities in order to fund programs like this. Uh, I am fortunate that, that we have leadership here that has put in some operational support, but I, I know that's, that's pretty rare. So the, the challenge is then how do you build this initiative that would bring in revenue, especially at a time where, where category three codes have no guaranteed revenue, even category one codes don't have guaranteed revenue. So I, I think the, the process that we established here was make sure we, we establish champions at different scales. We have to have the clinical champion, you know, the surgeons, the, the cardiologists, the uh, orthopedic docs, they all support the 3D technology right now because they believe it brings them value. So we established that champion. Then we need a leadership champion in order to facilitate all these downstream steps. And then we establish uh, an order champion, you know, with your EHR to make sure you have appropriate information that you're tracking, both for production, but then also for downstream billing. And then we identified a billing champion. So we have these champions, all these different levels that enabled us to, one, have basic communication. If you don't have communication between these different departments, these different entities, then you're not going to figure out how to create a new order. You're not going to figure out how to link that order to a billable event. Uh, and then you're, you're not going to have these category three codes, which have a very low chance of, of reimbursement even being established, because it does impact the overall denial rate for, 
for claims, which can be a factor. But if you have institutional support, leadership support, then you can make a lot of those uh, bumps in the road part of the process as opposed to hindrance. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think the bumps in the road, I mean, the champions and the bumps are kind of the, you know, some of the keys, like figuring out who the champions are and seeing the bumps before they, uh, before they derail you. Um, Jay, would you, um, would you care to comment just on, um, you know, on setting this up? Obviously, Mayo Clinic's had a lab running for a long time and as a leader in this field, how do you see and how have you seen, um, you know, trying to move from providing this as a service that was done uh, irregardless of payment to trying to move toward something that may be a billable, uh, a billable service. Yeah, thanks, Andy. And I, I think all the points that have been made to date um, by you and Frankie and, and Justin are all like really important that people understand the basics and then what it takes. So um, when we went into billing, we did several of the things Justin talked about. You know, we have to first there has to be an order. You know, if you're going to provide a medical item as the standard of care, it has to be an orderable item in your institution because that order is then tied to a procedure or a surgery or a lab test, um, which has to be completed. And once that order is completed, then that gets sent to billing um, in order to be billed. So um, we transitioned, um, basically in February, we started billing full time. Um, and we transitioned from the big picture of idea that we're improving care and saving time in the OR, hence saving money while we're improving care, to the fact that we're going to bill as the standard of care for the models and the guides that we create. Um, and last year, for example, we did about 2,000 models for about 852 patients. So um, it's not trivial to just turn it on. And, and one thing I'd also like to note is once you turn it on, you can't just say you're just kidding because when you send out a bill to a patient through your billing organization, it, once you start billing, it's, it's with a whole other group of people, you know, that are billing the patient. It's going to go to an insurance company. The insurance company is going to either approve it or deny it, and they're going to approve it um, and maybe pay you a little, maybe pay you what you ask, um, and anywhere in between. If it gets denied, uh, patients have to appeal that denial. They have to know how to do that. Sometimes you have to assist them in doing that. If they get denied uh, a second time, sometimes it leads to a physician-physician uh, contact, which we do in clinical care all the time um, for Category 1 codes. And then ultimately you might have to write letters based on uh, medical data in the literature to go back to Frankie's point. So ultimately a patient is going to get a bill. And it's, it's not a tiny uh, bill if you're honest about this. So when we started billing, we went through the process like Justin stated. We had to engage our EPIC team, which is our electronic medical record. Um, years ago, we did, we did a custom EPIC bill for an order. So we've had an orderable item for probably about five years now. Um, but tying that orderable item that leads into uh, an EPIC schematic um, bill and then ending that with a dictation, that dictation being led by charge champions to go to a coding group. It all happened seamlessly now, but it all had to be built. So we were just on the phone with Arizona, for example, before this, going through the process of how to set this up in Arizona um, now that it's built. Because if you're in a bigger institution, once it's built and you're all in the same EMR, well, then you're all in the same enterprise. But you're interacting with different insurance companies. So Blue Cross, Blue Shield, United, Medicare, Medicaid, um, even within your state, so Arizona's Blue Cross Blue Shield is totally different than Minnesota. So I think engaging in your EMR, getting orderable items, engaging billing people early, because that group of people is highly knowledgeable about this, and then what you're going to do as a strategy if the patient gets a bill that's not reimbursed, up until the point with engaging in charity care. and Because um, you can't just say to the insurance company, sorry, we're just kidding. Um, just to raise that bill from the record. So that was one of our hesitancies, like when do you turn it on? Because as Frankie said, we're in category three, it hasn't been valued. We took a long time to value it honestly, which I would ask anybody in here to do, be honest about the time and cost of this, because that will come into the ACR registry. And then, you know, we had to value it ourselves and then bill what we felt was appropriate for our institution. 
Yeah, those are yeah some excellent comments. I think there's about 40 things to dive into there, uh, Jay. Um, I, I guess talking about value, I have a question for uh, for you, Frankie. Um, talking about value, the registry obviously will collect effort uh, information surrounding you know the effort that goes into um, you know both physician effort and non-physician effort. I wonder if you might be able to talk to that piece a little bit. Um, we we didn't get into a lot of that earlier, but just to talk to the fact that you know much of the effort in creating these models will probably be done by non-physicians, and and then talk to value that's built today, and, and it does or does that uh, does it or does does it not matter in the long run when we go toward for a category one? Thanks. That's a great question. It certainly matters, and it matters a lot. So. If you want to draw some analogies in terms of physician time versus non-physician time or technical components of codes versus professional components of codes as they exist, for example, um, for rate, let's just take radiologists and surgeons as two examples. Um, the technical component of an advanced imaging study, which for CMS is defined as a CT scan, an MRI, a nuclear medicine med study, or an ultrasound, that technical component reimbursement is many times larger than the professional component or the interpretation. Sometimes on the order of kind of five to one is a general um, is a, a general rule, and so. If you have a complex MRI, the professional component can be on the order of $100 and the technical component can be on the order of 500 or more dollars. And so um, just as economy of scale, the technical component is incredibly important. And it that is why the registry takes so much time and effort to capture all of those um, technical components that include the time for a non-physician to work, but also the equipment uh, obviously, materials go into uh, making uh, the model and the machine types. All of those things need to be factored into it, and that's why it's um, been so meticulously done. Um, and we want to emphasize that the technical component is critical. Um, I'm not a surgeon, but I can. I think I could speak clearly that you know the technical component, the OR fees, are um, you know have to cover an enormous amount of overhead and cost as opposed to the professional component um, that will uh, go to the surgeon or the surgeon surgeon's um, you know, practice plan in, in some way to actually reimburse um, uh, the surgeons for actually doing the procedure. It is that technical component that forms the greatest piece. One thing that we anticipated, but maybe we didn't talk about enough, and it's so critical to communicate, 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 is that the category three codes don't inherently talk about those technical components, but they are being gathered in the registry and they're essential in terms of fair reimbursement, you know, of the um, of the of the category one codes when they come. If they will, you know, they're the part of the George Washington painting that's not shown, right? You know, you just see George, you don't see a whole other white space, right? That all really is the technical fees that are going to be critical in the arguments um, at the Rock and when the Category 1 codes get, um, get championed. I would, I would, I would add Go ahead. that when we assigned value, um, we certainly took the technical component into because we, we, we build everything in radiology with almost everything with a professional and a technical component. So we are building in that nature. And that's why it's so important that people are actually honest about the true cost and the true time that it takes to do this. Um, because when it goes to the rock and people who don't know anything about radiology or 3D printing, um, they're going to look into the literature and they're going to look into what people actually do and they're going to look at registry type data. Um, and if someone's saying, oh, I built that in five minutes on, on a homemade 3D printer for, you know, 20 bucks, well, um, you know, that's not the true cost of actually building a diagnostic medical model. And 
the technical component, like Frankie said, is important. And, and we're labs of all different sizes. We're a diverse group of people. There's people that simply have a form lab. There's people that have J750s, Mimakis, HPs, EOS printers. They all can make anatomic models and coming up with some value there. One point I would like to make is where you put your lab also makes a difference. So where your imaging center is, where you deliver chemotherapy, where your operating rooms are, all make a difference in reimbursement. So our lab is in the hospital and we're considered outpatient hospital space. That bills at a different rate than an outpatient center. So. Um, when you're building a space, if you haven't already built a space, uh, it's important how you designate that space. And people within your hospital committee uh, and the billing people will know this, which is another reason to engage with them early before you're uh, out somewhere else in an outpatient setting and realizing why can't I get the same billing that maybe somebody else um, has gotten. So we did take into account the technical components, the professional components, and we're really honest about it. And then every hospital system takes that and adds whatever the hospital system adds in it in order to deliver that care. Yeah, uh, it, I think that's excellent discussion. I mean, I think um, we had had some earlier discussion about the, um, you know, the physician component versus the practice, practice, practice expense component of it. And I think, you know, it, it, it's clear to me that they need to be accounted for. And today, you know, if you can account for them by, by using modifiers, uh, great. If you can't, it should be one, you know, one piece of it that your institution will then judge. I think, Jay, like you're saying, what, you know, what, what else goes into that? Because obviously kind of overhead has to be accounted for as well. I, I wonder, um, you know, if we can talk about that, maybe Justin, if you wouldn't mind, um, you know, uh, talking a little bit about how you've looked at this uh, for valuation and things that, um, that that are included. There's a question from uh, from one of the uh, one of the people joining us today uh, about about this, and is it based on the question is is the valuation based on time, segmentation, CAD, planning meetings, materials, printers? Um, do you mind talking to that and kind of the scope? Yeah, and feel free to correct me, but um, there are two modifiers for these codes. There's uh, hyphen TC and hyphen 26, if I'm correct, uh, the technical component and the uh, professional fee. Um, our institution reviewed that initially as two separate modifiers, but ultimately deemed that we should just do a unified code. So that was our approach. So internally from there, we figured out a, a cost-based system for taking all of that into account. So. The technical component does include segmentation, does include the labor of running the printer, of post-processing. Uh, it doesn't necessarily include the time of the, the print itself. That was our approach. Uh, other institutions might take uh, you know, exception to that. Some of these printers like EOS do take very significant energy utilization into account. So that could have a very significant cost impact on the printer. So I think you know, more so than anything else is making sure you're documenting all these different aspects of your system so that everyone is on the same page across this board. If you have all these different champions who have a different perspective on what is being built, that, that can have very significant impact as to the approach. It could also help, uh, you know, in relation to the registry. The registry does have a very significant quality improvement element. So when we start to run reports and understand where we are maybe missing opportunities as individual centers, we, we have an opportunity to address that. So it's, I think our approach here has been consistency and transparency across all these different stakeholders, and I'm looking forward to the future for these quality improvement initiatives. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the keys um, that, that's been mentioned a couple of times is relating to the fact that people will have, institutions will have different types of lab setups, and, and some of them may be small, some of them may be large, some of them may be Overstaffed, some of them may be understaffed, some of them may have really expensive pieces of machinery and others not. I think um, to me, the registry is some some kind of an equalization device as well for figuring out what's what's most used, you know, what what has clinical value and and if somebody making a model on a on a million dollar printer could be making that same model with the same value on a ten thousand dollar printer, there's obviously, you know, there's obviously some discussion I think to be had. I wonder um uh, switching gears just a little bit, I, I, I do want to talk about um, 
I want to talk about value um, and about uh, payment and, and reimbursement in a minute. Frankie, I wondered if you might um, talk to us a little bit about some some historical reference for things you've seen start in the uh, T code arena and move toward uh, move toward a category one code and and specifically uh, talk about value and and maybe I don't know reimbursement rates and denial rates kind of in the short term versus the long term because I think we're in that phase right now where we're we're obviously jug we're trying to get long term reimbursement but we obviously would love to have some short term reimbursement today too. Sure, but uh, um, I'm just kind of ruminating on your comment. I don't know of any hospital based 3D printing group that's understaffed or overstaffed. <laughs> I think they're all understaffed. Anyone that has um <laughs> has too many people, you know, <laughs> just looking for, you know, you know, looking was for slightly tongue in people. cheek. <laughs> yeah, just let me know. <laughs> Please yeah. let me know. Um, so I think Generally, we're lean and mean. We're not overstaffed, but I'll, I'll let that one slide. Your, I think your question's really relevant. Um, let me think about it so that I answer it uh, well. Um, there are cases historically that we should pay attention to, for sure, in terms of uh, economics and reimbursement. And there are ways to do it right. And I think that there's lessons learned from how we could have done it better. Um, so one of the, um, you know, one of, I think, um, things that comes to mind is in cardiac imaging when um, CT came to use. And so I'll use that as an example. Um, the way that we started to get reimbursement for a specific type of CT scan of the heart, you know, followed this pathway of very low reimbursements, exploratory phase um, T codes or category three codes that were used to collect data and used by organizations. And those organizations were very, very data driven and very, very thoughtful and thinking as is the companies that worked with those industry academic collaborations that you know, if we do this right and we collect the data the right way, um, we can show enormous value in the things that we do. In that case, you know, looking at, you know, anatomy and in some levels, physiology of the heart and the hemodynamic significance of um, coronary arteries, coronary artery disease. And that was a 10 year plus um, uh, project, just to give people a frame of reference. and. It worked out for uh, many people and for many patients very well in so much as um, people went along, they ran, you know, they ran uh, cardiac CT scans. It takes a long time to do the study. There are a lot of parallels between 3D printing and, and cardiac CT. And people saw it along to category one codes and then, you know, deeper dives into that data in ways that um, it has become a very essential and a part of the infrastructure and has strong lobbying and has strong society support. So being in it for the long haul is the way that it's designed, right? And I'm, you know, like you can, you know, that, that's just the way that, that we did it. And, you know, we're in it for the long haul, we're in it to get the data, but in doing so, there's gotta be that inherent buy-in that we're all in it for the long haul and we're all willing to put that data in, we're all willing to, chip into the registry and show the time and show the value. Because I, I believe the value is very, very high and we need, to, we need to demonstrate that value. Here's the danger. There are some scenarios, and I won't go into them in detail, where things, um, uh, so I don't want to you know, pull up any prejudice against any one type of um, code. There are things that physicians do that are probably a lot less valued than people would like. And my experience in reading the history and kind of being there is that's what happens when people aren't all working together and people aren't showing the value. And so you can come up with a category one code that has um, not a lot of oomph at the rock and not a lot of um, RVUs, and we don't wanna be in that situation. That would be the worst case scenario. 
you're better off not having a code and going back to the old historical way than having a code yeah. that's well. So we all kind of have to be in it together. That's, I think, the best way I can answer for you. Okay. Yeah, I like I think, that. I think it's why it's so um, valuable for people to publish their honest, truthful um, work in this area about um, time, cost. And that's why the registry is going to be so valuable because all of these data points are in the registry. and. Um, you know, it's going to take everybody doing that and filling out these um, registry data forms to, to really get the right value. Because Frankie is absolutely right. If you go, we do all this work and three years later, we're being highly undervalued because we didn't provide the right amount of data. Um, then it'll be a, a, a we wrap it code, as he said. So, so I think it's an interesting, Jay, I have kind of a follow on. Um, it's an interesting kind of area because we're obviously talking about the cost to provide this, but we're also talking about the value it brings to the users and to the patients of these devices. Um, as I was kind of just getting my head around today's webinar a little bit and doing a, a brief review of kind of uh, policy statements that I could find to some of the payers online, it wasn't surprising that I found these codes that have been established, the Category 3 codes, are mostly put into a list of uh, investigational experimental um, codes for non-payment, which I think is expected behavior for these category three codes um, until data is kind of built up. But it obviously leaves it at a, uh, a voluntarily reimbursable given an institution and given a, a an individual patient's need. My question is what, what arguments have you used to successfully convince payers to provide for uh, models and guides? What, what types of things seem uh, important to the payers? Well, the payers, um, the payers like data. That's for sure. When they're divide, when they're creating their rule infrastructure, if you've ever seen a payer's kind of fishbowl diagram of this, this, then this, and how they come up with should we pay for this or not, essentially they're all algorithmically driven by data that's been presented. Um, we have had not a lot of denials to this point, but again, I think using us as a test is is not maybe representative of the country because we have large contracts across five states that have been very well negotiated for very big institutions. So um, some things that Mayo maybe can, can get through um, the insurance company, your average hospital might not be able to, but, but they like data. So I built an entire spine ablation practice over the same amount of time as we built this 3D printing practice. And, it, and as Frankie said, there are a lot of parallels. So initially, you might get reimbursed, but then when you do enough of something, you start to, you know, somebody starts to notice, and then they want data. So during a first denial, we provide letters that are based on what the current literature shows. For example, in cranium facial, there's really good data about um, improvement in patient care and why we should do it. Uh, so that providing those papers to an insurance company with a detailed letter. Mrs. Johnson came with a mandible cancer. This is her care. This is what we we're going to do. Here's the data that shows that we did this and why we did this um, and to back up what you're doing. And, and sometimes that's it. And they pay for it. Sometimes it leads to a physician-physician phone call and they pay for it. And sometimes you have to go the distance beyond that. But um, insurance companies like data. I mean, any, any state insurance company, any private insurance company, they base will we pay for that on data. And there's different quality of the data, which is a whole different talk, but um, Frankie is absolutely right about this. Uh, Justin, I wonder if you have any comments on kind of the real world feedback you've heard as well on the category three codes and what payers um, think of and how they treat category three codes? Yeah, I would say our, our experience is quite a bit different. You know, being a, a much smaller institution, smaller billing team, um, we, we've had a much higher denial rate. And our, our approach, we, we've attempted, um, you know, appeals, as, as Jay described, but we, we haven't been too successful. I would say our billing team understands the bigger picture with regards to the RUC. And our understanding is when the RUC reviews this, they review the utilization of codes from CMS and CMS affiliate payers. So our, our team is much more responsive to, to billing and appealing with those specific payers, while the, the other payers who are not affiliates 
when a contract review cycle happens, it is under consideration to try to build in support for these 3D print codes, as Jay described. So that, that's been our approach. We've been a bit more pragmatic and also looking at the bigger picture and trying to allocate our scarce resources to what we think is going to have the best impact now and then also in the future. So that's been our, our approach in this. Thanks. Um, Jay, a little bit of a follow on. Uh, if you um, if you've had cases kind of go through and you fought the fight and you've got you've won, um, you know, uh, won over the ability to provide service and get it paid for. Does that help with the same uh, the same payer or the same type of case with the same payer? Have you found that they start to kind of get it um, or is every is every case uh, uh, another battle? Well, I think I think it's um, it's unique, right? Like we do a lot of cranial maxillofacial guides, so um, maybe they're starting to get it for cranial maxillofacial guides and orthopedic guides. Um, but since we're so, we're so variable in anatomic models, every case is kind of very unique, you know, because we go from pelvic tumors to thoracic tumors to bone tumors, and um, they're all very they're all very unique. And and I don't think we have enough data yet. We've only been doing it since February. We're going to have a six-month kind of um, come-through moment where we evaluate all the payers, evaluate the amount we get paid for the first model and each additional model. Because um, sometimes you might get paid for the first model, but then they don't pay for any of the additional parts of the model. You know, you might get paid for the first part, and then they deny the other four parts. Um, we have a whole Medicare team um, that's just focusing on the Medicare reimbursement side and government payers. Um, so we're going to have a kind of six-month meeting with the billing folks, the Medicare, Medicaid billing folks, the cross-state billing folks, because we have some unique things where we're designing and printing things in Rochester, shipping them overnight to Florida as they build up their infrastructure. Um, and we have to be able to bill for something that's crossing state lines in two different time zones, and billing codes don't like different time zones. So. Um, I think we just keep working through the uniqueness of this um, challenge, and and in six months maybe we'll have some data of like, hey, is United getting it? Is you know, is is Bluegrass Blue Shield Arizona getting? You know, I just don't know. Yeah, I think back to something Justin said. It, it seems clear that there is a uh, some ability to track the code's usage as well. You know, which is important that. I think now that we have this code that it's at least, uh, you know, we're attempting to to get it paid, even if there's a denial, potentially that's a benefit for us to show widespread widespread use in some way. Um, obviously, I think the registry is probably a better place to do that. Um, there was a question, so taking a question or two from the, um, from the audience, uh, Frankie, maybe you could talk to this a little bit. I know there was some discussion earlier about the, the registry and kind of the critical um, uh, critical volume or critical mass of cases needed to kind of progress. Do you have any uh, any comment there? More the merrier <laughs> is the real answer. Um, as opposed to a critical number of cases, I think it's better to think about it in terms of a critical number of centers and those centers are distributed. So I, I ideally we'd have in all parts of the United States, in many of them, you know, I put 15 on the slide, but you know, 100 would be way better than 15. Um, and that each one would have um, entered clinical scenarios or clinical indications um, that, are va that are valuable. And so I, I don't think that there's an exact number, um, but the distribution is very important, and we do want um, to have a lot of them. And it is um, it is essential to put your case in the registry and um, and use the code. Right, using the code is helpful in and of itself in the long term because um, CMS will certainly read the paper. You know that is you know that that one paper should be the number one paper that goes on the long form for the. Category one code, and I intend it to be. Um, so they'll read it, but having the experience with the code um, and that within CMS, that's why it exists. It's to gather data. So um, okay, a lot is better. Okay, good. I'll say I'm going to answer as many of these questions as I can by typing. If you see me typing, so yeah, uh, yeah. I, 
I, uh, so we've got about five minutes left. Um, I wanted to focus maybe one last question to all three of you relating, um, relating to a slide in Frankie's talk, um, you know, that kind of prompts the question of what happens, what happens next? Um, and it's the slide that said code does not equal payment. And I think that this is clear today that code does not equal payment because the T codes aren't valued and uh, they're voluntarily reimbursed. But when we get to a category one code and it has some value assigned, it doesn't necessarily mean that payers will pay that value. It just means that it has a, a relative value unit uh, attached to it. So my question to each of you is kind of thinking outside of the registry and the great work that we need to do to collect data there. What else do we need to do and what else are you working on that relates to uh, proving that clinical efficacy and trying to push this forward to, to eventually get people to see that it's worthwhile to pay for models and guides. So I'll, I'll uh, toss to whoever wants to start off. I could go, I could go first. I mean, <laughs> I don't think this needs to be explained, but I'll just say anyway, which is, you know, um, money doesn't just fall out of the sky, right? So it's a zero sum game in terms of the healthcare dollars. So the money that goes towards anatomic models and anatomic guides is going to come from somebody else's budget. So it's a shifting, right? It's not just the creation. Uh, it's not the, the creation of money. And so the most, to, to answer your question, the specific thing that you could do is communicate and collaborate. There will be a point where people realize, you know, what's obvious to some, which is that the money um, for the models has got to come from somewhere. And if it's going to be helping time in the OR, it's going to come out of OR reimbursement, or at least part of OR reimbursement. And so there, there is an impending collision there. People don't talk about it a lot. People don't recognize it a lot. But if it's a zero-sum game, a fair reimbursement has to come from somewhere. And so I think that establishing those valid relationships and communicating and including, you know, including as many people on the discussions up front while we work through these several years is the most important thing we can do because that's going to be a conversation that should be had all along the way at the last minute. There shouldn't be this incredible realization that healthcare you can for some game and we can't create the money. We've got to take it from all different places. If we recognize that now and think about that now, we're going to be a lot farther along than if we have to have that conversation in a year or in two years and people haven't thought about it. So please yeah. engage and please communicate with the people um, that are doing the work and using your work because if you do that communication effectively, you're going to make it a lot easier down the road. Okay. And, and I, I would, Jay, I, go would ahead. I mean, Frank is just so wise when it comes to this stuff. I would kind of defer almost anything to his vision. But uh, this happens. That's why it's so important for multidisciplines to be involved. We're, we're and just I think, are centered in a multidisciplinary, non siloed place where people aren't fixated on, oh, I'm doing just this work and no, you can't do it. This really has to be a non-siloed, multidisciplinary group of people with all access because one of the reasons we were able to expand locally so fast is because we had all the surgeons on board. And the surgeons were part of the team and the surgeons were the ones benefiting from our work and they were the ones who really pushed, you know, CEO, CFO, people that need to control the money to allow us to expand to say, this is really improving care. And it, when it comes to billing, which I do a lot of work in the spine world, I can tell you having multidisciplinary letters of appropriateness from say like, just not the ACR, but when we have things that's like from the ACR, the ASNR, the American College of Neurosurgery, the American College of Orthopedic Spine, all coming together to make consensus documents, it holds a lot more weight than when one specialty alone is saying, I, I think we should be doing this and the others are kind of don't take my money on the fence. So I, I totally agree with what, what Frankie said. And, and, I, yeah. and I close by saying like, at, you know, at your own institution, you should really engage the coding and billing folks early um, as, as well as their leadership and talk about this 
and then make an educated decision on whether you want to start billing or not. Certainly there's still a great case to be made before billing of cost effectiveness within cranium maxillofacial, within congenital heart, within orthopedics where you're actually saving money in the big picture of reduced OR time, improved outcomes, less take backs to the OR, um, even without billing. But, um, you know, each institution is going to have to make their own kind of decision. Should we start billing or should we just keep going gathering data um, until we can get to that category one phase? Okay, thanks, Jay. Justin? Yeah, I think it's kind of hard to add on to what Frankie said. It's uh, so elegant and focused. You know, I think the other element is on the completely opposite side. We can't neglect all these other elements in 3D printing and medicine while we focus on billing. So focusing on making the appropriateness criteria, you know, update, uh, focusing on, on building inroads with DICOM, making sure that we as users push 3D software and hardware vendors to create tools for our specific domains. We can't wait for, for that to happen before billing happens. We, we need to make sure we push that parallel. So while we engage with our billing teams, while we engage with our EPIC teams in order to facilitate billing, we, we can't let off on the gas on all these other critical elements. Otherwise, we're gonna have a very significant lag between achieving you know, potentially CPT one code and having all these other resources that need to catch up. So it's on us to, to make sure holistically that we are developing all these different uh, avenues of progress. It's great. Yeah, I think it's a, a super point about uh, about the appropriateness criteria and the work, many, many of those things, the work of the SIG. So um, with that, I will uh, I'll close this out and just say thank you to uh, to all of the panelists for joining us today, taking time out of your schedule both today and in preparation. And thanks to all the attendees. Uh, we appreciate RSNA helping to host this and uh, look forward to more of these ahead. So thank you everyone and uh, have a good day. Bye-bye, take care. Thanks.